So some of you might know I had a debate with Jan LeCun um, a couple weeks ago. Some of you might know, in fact, um, that I'm viewed as an AI contrarian, that I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, negative on deep learning and think that the field hasn't come along too much. And if you didn't already know that, you'll know that soon. Um, but uh, I had a debate with Jan LeCun, who is you know, one of the, the founders of, of deep learning. And before I had the debate, uh, I made a list of seven things that I thought we would agree about. And I did a practice talk with my friends before this debate. You can watch the debate on, on YouTube, by the way. It was about um, innateness, whether, there, whether we need more stuff built in uh, uh, into AI. And I'll talk about that later. Um, but so I made this list. I sent it to Jan because um, my friend said, do you know that Jan will really believe all this stuff? And I said, I think I have a good model of Jan LeCun. We're both professors at NYU, but you know, I'll go check. And Jan wrote back about half an hour later, and he said, not only do I agree with all seven of these, but it's the essence of what I've been arguing in my talks for the last couple of years. So it's good to have an understanding that even though there's a lot that's controversial in AI, and I'll certainly say some controversial things, that there are some things that at least some reasonable people who disagree about a lot of things can agree on. Um, so. I hope you will all watch that debate, and so you won't just get my perspective on things today. You'll get, you get his, too. Um, but we all agreed that AI is still in its infancy. I'll try to give you some examples of that today. Um, we all agree that, that machine learning is fundamentally necessary for reaching strong AI, that deep learning is a powerful uh, technique for machine learning. I think some people think that I think that deep learning isn't a powerful technique, but I do, in fact, believe that. Um, but both Jan and I also agreed that it's not sufficient uh, on its own for cognition. We're also both pretty down on model-free uh, reinforcement learning like they do at DeepMind, and I'll, I'll mention that at least a little bit later. Um, we agreed that AI still needs or uh, can will always need, <laughs> for a while, <coughs> better internal forward models, better models of what the world is, um, and that common sense reasoning remains fundamentally unsolved. And part of the reason I'm here for the next few days is to talk uh, specifically with Oren about common sense reasoning. And I'll, I'll, to jog that conversation, I'm going to talk about common sense now a little bit. Um, but there are people that are much more optimistic than either Jan or myself, um, like Andrew Eng, who's you know, a, a very well-known figure in the field. And he recently uh, had a Harvard Business Review article, which was kind of trying to tell executives what AI can and can't do. And I very much disagree with the, the cut on the world that, that Andrew uh, proposed. He said that AI can now, or at least pretty soon, automate essentially anything that a person can do in a second. And I wish that were true, because I think if that were true, it would mean that strong AI was solved and I could go to the beach. Um, but I think the reality is we're not even close to that. There are some things that humans can do in a second that uh, AI can do really well. So um, AI now using deep learning can tell the difference between Tiger Woods and a golf ball. It can do that in less than a second. It can probably also uh, distinguish Angelina Jolie. Um, and the, the dominant paradigm, as I'm sure you all know, and some of you probably participated, um, is basically taking in big data and forming statistical approximations, usually using the technology that Jan LeCun invented, which is a convolutional neural network, um, which is an extension of neural networks themselves that are 60 years old. Uh, but of course, there's some caveats. Um, so one of the first caveats is you need a huge amount of data, um, depending on the nature of your problem. You also ne often need vast amounts of data. And generalization can be very limited. So these kinds of techniques, do I have a pointer here? Um, I have a pointer that doesn't work very well, but I'll use my finger instead. Um, if you think of some distribution of possible examples, techniques like deep learning, which is, of course, the most popular technique we have right now, are very good on the left hand of the distribution and pretty weak on the right hand of the distribution. I'll give you some um, examples of that right now. But, so if you've got a lot of data about Tiger Woods, you might be great. If you have relatively little data about grapefruits, maybe you won't be so good about, um, with the grapefruits. And if you think about com combinatorial things, um, where you're looking at combinations of features like, I don't know, small grapefruits that might actually balance on the top of this glass or something like that, you might not have any data at all. And then deep learning is really of no uh, use. And so you often get bizarre failures. Um, I'll give you an example of one in a second. Um, here's the kind of thing a person can do in a second. And you might think, hey, deep learning has finally licked this problem. Um, I'll call it the captioning problem. So you describe this picture. So you see this picture, and you have to come up with a caption like, a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. And the, this is um, data, so to speak, from a Google paper that was described in the New York Times a couple of years ago, I think on the front page. And people thought, ah, we finally solved the captioning problem. The source of the breakthrough was that somebody finally had a database of 
uh, pictures and, and language descriptions for pictures, and they were able to use that to get some pretty impressive results. So like this one, um, and you know, how would you describe this one? Well, maybe you'd say it's a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road, and that's what the computer says. And so you get the illusion that deep learning has come close to solving the captioning problem, which would be amazing if we really could solve it. If we really had machines that could look at arbitrary pictures and give descriptions that we humans accept as correct, I think that, that would itself be a sign of, of uh, general intelligence. In fact, I've been working on replacing the Turing test, and some people in this room have contributed um, to the efforts that I've been trying to do. One of the things that I've proposed as a test is, is basically comprehension of things like images and videos. And if you just look at some of the examples in these kinds of papers, and there were a lot of them in the last couple of years, you might think that you know, we've made significant progress. But you might look more carefully at some, some of the um, errors and realize we actually have a long way to go. So you could look at this. It's a little bit of an unusual image. Um, you might come up with various kinds of captions, but you probably would not come up with a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. If you did, I would refer you to Oliver Sacks, if he were still with us, who wrote, The Man Who Mistook His Wife uh, for a Hat. This is that kind of error. It's not an optical illusion, as the fans of deep learning like to say. This is more like a hallucination, or it's just um, wrong. I think it's characteristic. And this is a long tail problem. Um, I showed it to you as an example. You're not going to have a lot of parking signs with stickers in your database, and the kinds of systems that are relying on massive data basically get themselves in trouble. Um, there are lots of other problems, too, even, even on the things that I think are most squarely within the domain of what deep learning does well. So you look at this, and you might say a pattern of orange and black stripes, but if your deep learning system um, trained on the ImageNet database that everybody's trained on, well, pattern of yellow and black stripes isn't an option. You only have the thousand categories that are there, and so you say school bus. Again, this is more like hallucination than, than optical illusion. Or you could look at this as a person and say, I don't know, a bunch of dots on a square. Um, but if you are trained in a closed world where you have a thousand choices and you have no way of even articulating other hypotheses, then maybe you would say it's a digital clock. Well, you wouldn't if you were a person, but that's what deep learning system does. Um, and then perception is much more than simple categorization. So what deep learning does best is categorization, things like image net, so you have these thousand categories, or speech recognition, where you have a, a fixed set um, of categories. But you could look at this and not only identify the dog, even if you don't have much data of dogs that are upside down uh, doing bench presses, not only could you identify the dog and the dumbbell, but you could look at it and say things like, I wonder how the dog got so ripped that it could lift uh, this big weight. Um, by the lack of laughing, I feel like you have not had enough coffee. What is going on here? Like, I've pilot tested this one. Jeez. All right. Um, we'll see if you laugh at this one, but here's another example um, of an inference that should tickle your funny bone and is also hard. Uh, for deep learning. Maybe I need to speak slower or let you look, um, <laughs> let you ponder the, this person's fate at, at a little um, greater length. We're, we're very worried about political correctness. Here, so <laughs> we can laugh at a joke about a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I took out at least half of my Trump jokes, so. Um, all right. So um, this is a problem of inference, right? It's not just that you want to categorize that. Um, there is either a parachute or a backpack, but you want to figure out what's happening next. We don't have AI systems that can do that at all. Um, you can do that in a second. Andrew Wang is just wrong if he thinks that you, your machine can do what you can. So here, here is Andrew's actual quote. If a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI either now or in the near future. And here is my emendation to his quote that I think is closer to the mark of, of where we actually are. Um, and I'm mostly talking about kind of the the large part of the field that right now is, is doing things like image recognition with deep learning. I realize you guys are doing something closer. And you know, if I ever come anywhere where I'm preaching the converted, it's probably this audience. So I'm kind of talking about broader trend in the field. Um, but so if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, and we can gather an enormous amount of directly relevant data, um, which is something Andrew leaves out, we have a fighting chance so long as the test data aren't too terribly different from the training data and the domain doesn't change too much over time. So you think about the most impressive demonstrations of AI lately, things like AlphaGo Zero, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, these are domains where you can get an enormous amount of directly relevant data because you can simulate things um, perfectly and you can kind of span the space of, of possible uh, situations that you might encounter. And so the test data aren't too terribly different from the training data, and the domain hasn't changed in 2,500 years since they invented the rules of Go. This is not necessarily characteristic of a lot of the domains that, that we might actually want to work on. Um, so 
there are things where people have made a lot of progress in AI lately, and I have them, some of them in green here. For example, speech recognition, especially in quiet rooms with native speakers asking search queries. Um, we are pretty good at image recognition in bounded worlds with limited numbers of objects. We're pretty good in natural language understanding in very narrowly bounded domains like movie times and sports scores. Um, and we're really good at advertising uh, targeting, which is like 70% of the research in AI. So we've gotten good at that. Um, there are lots of things that we're still pretty poor at. So we still don't have anything like open-ended conversational interfaces. Um, we, I would say, don't have anything like automated scientific discovery, though if anybody is working on something relevant to that, it's probably in this room. Um, automated medical diagnosis, I think, is still a long way away. You may know about Watson and um, uh, you know, one at Jeopardy, and the original plan was to make it do automated uh, medical diagnosis. And you can look up what happened at MD Anderson, uh, the cancer center there, when, when IBM tried to apply Watson to automated medical diagnosis. People are talking about doing automated scene comprehension um, for blind people, but what they really have is things that will like label the most prominent object in a room. So I could go around this room and it might tell me camera or person, but that's not telling me that there's a group of people listening to a lecture, possibly falling asleep, et cetera. Um, domestic robots is something we would like to have, or elder care robots. We're not anywhere close to doing that. And one could wonder how close we are to safe and reliable driverless cars. So we can build driverless cars that go on limited routes and so forth, but whether they're safe or reliable and whether they can go without detailed maps and um, in places like New York City is, is a totally open question. So the way I think about it is, as a cognitive scientist, is there are many things that go at least into natural cognition. My perspective on artificial intelligence comes from natural intelligence, which is what, where I spent most of my career. Um, and I would say that there are lots of things that go into natural intelligence. There's language, there's perception, there's planning, uh, and so forth, reasoning. And really, all the fuss lately has been about progress on perception. And there's been almost no progress on the rest of the pie chart. My biggest fear about AI is not uh, the Terminator and Skynet, which is, of course, what gets all, all the attention right now, um, but it's actually getting stuck. So you know, the, the dominant metaphor, and it's not even metaphor, the dominant intellectual tool is, at some level in machine learning is uh, the idea of local minima and, and avoiding local minima. I'm afraid that AI is heading towards a local minima. Um, and I'll, I'll add something about that in a second. So the idea is we want to be climbing down some mountain, uh, and we take small incremental steps, and we get to something that's you know, the bottom of one valley, but it's not really the bottom of the mountain. That's my biggest worry um, about AI, is that we're, we're going to get stuck, um, which would be a shame. I mean, if we never um, got past the local minimum, we might never, even if we could you know, be great at targeting advertising and you know, there's a lot of money to be made from AI right now, we might never build machines that can actually read, that can discover cures for cancer, that understand how the brain works, um, can build domestic robots and so forth. Um, so I actually made this uh, graph about a year ago um, and talking about gradient descent through model space. So you can think that what deep learning does is it does gradient descent through um, a space of possible models to do object recognition. But the field is kind of doing gradient descent through a set of models and algorithms and so forth to do things like object recognition. And it's made very steady progress. So you know, people could not do object recognition worth beans in 1980. And they got better, and they got better, and there were big advances in 2012. Um, 2017 hasn't actually seen a lot of big advances. I, I've been talking to people lately, like, what's the big advance in deep learning this year? And there hasn't really been one. I mean, the Hinton Capsule Networks, for example, is an interesting paper, but um, most people would say it's early. It's not clear what it shows. Um, it's possible they're actually getting close to that local minimum. Um, Hinton himself, well, I, I guess I have the quote later, but it is, is backing off from um, uh, the kind of stuff we're doing. So my biggest fear is this, that we're going to get in a local minima. Um, and we are making this kind of you know, gradual progress in speech recognition, object recognition, language translation. Um, but there are some other problems where it's not clear we're getting anywhere near um, to genuine improvement. So natural language understanding, I would say we've not made real progress since ELISA in 1965, which used templates. We made some progress, but I, I would say that Fundamentally, we still don't understand how to do it. Um, the systems that are kind of dominant right now um, in terms of like the deep learning tradition are very easily fooled. I, I should have had a quote up here um, 
or should have put in a slide here, especially for this crowd, from Percy Yang stuff. Has anybody seen this from this year with a distractor word? So at least some of you know this. So you know, it sort of looks right, and then you put in a couple of irrelevant words in an in a embedded clause, and the whole system basically falls apart. Um, so it's not clear that the kind of progress that we're making as we march down towards minimizing error on particular data sets is really getting us where we ought to go. The fundamental risk, of course, is that we might spend an enormous amount of time on a particular task going to hit a wall. And if you're just doing license plate recognition and you get really good at it but not perfect, maybe that's fine. Uh, but there are other domains where the cost of being less than perfectly accurate is pretty high. So um, if you have a recommendation engine that, that asymptotes at 2.5% uh, correct because you went down the wrong path and you hit a local minimum, Nobody cares. I mean, if I'm recommending songs to you, and 39 out of 40 of the songs are songs you like, and I could have, if I had done a better job giving you a 40th song, I can just say, ah, I was giving you something new to see if you liked it. Um, right? So it, it, it's not a big deal. But if I'm building a pedestrian detector, and it's 97.5% <coughs> correct in my driverless car, and I put out a fleet of a million driverless cars, this is, you know, this is mayhem. Um, it'll be the end of the driverless car uh, program probably not for better, actually for worse, because we would actually like to have driverless cars to save people's lives. But if what happens is on a particular day, a particular aggressive manufacturer rolls something out in a lot of cars and a lot of people die, you be in trouble. Um, same thing with domestic robots. So if I have a domestic robot that picks up grandpa and puts him in his bed 39 times out of 40 correctly and drops him on the 40th time, I do not have a viable solution. Um, so why aren't we there yet? Why have we not gotten to strong AI? Um, in the 60s, when people like Minsky and McCarthy, for whom one third of this room is named, um, were working on uh, strong AI, they had excuses that they could readily supply. They could say, we don't have a lot of memory here. Our computers are slow, especially if they could have imagined ahead into the future and realized that some guy would have a watch on his hand that had much more power than any of those guys had to work with. So you know, in the 60s, we were very bounded by compute, by memory, and so forth. But 60 years later, we're not so bounded by those things. If Google wants to run, you know, put teraflops on playing Go, they more or less can, or at least they're pretty close to being able to do that. Um, and yet, 60 years later, a lot of very smart people have thought about these puzzles. We're not really there yet. So what are some impediments to reaching strong AI? Um, one is, as I said in the beginning, this should maybe be on the slide, I think we all agree that machine learning has to be part of the answer. You cannot hard code all of the knowledge that you need about the world uh, in order to do a strong AI. So that means you have to use machine learning. Um, might not be the machine learning that we're using now. Maybe we're doing machine learning in totally the wrong way. But engineering machine learning is hard. It's a very different thing than classical programming. So in classical programming, you can build small modules. You can prove to your own satisfaction anyway that they work. And in certain cases, you can just prove that they work. And then you put those together into larger systems and larger systems and so forth. At least the way that machine learning is being practiced right now, we don't have, oh, I'm sorry, and then you can go and debug them. So you can revise them incrementally. You can say, I want this module to do something slightly different, but you can know what the consequences are going to be for other systems. When people do what they call end-to-end -end deep learning, uh, as they're often doing now, which is like your input is pixels and your output is an action for an Atari game system or something like that, there's no way to do the same kind of incremental debugging. And if you're in a small, limited domain like Atari games, maybe that's OK. But if you want to build larger systems and kind of use your AI um, as services, as people talk about it now in, in industry, we don't know how to make those services work reliably. Um, Peter uh, Norvig gave a great talk at MTech two years ago, which I urge you all to see, um, where he talked about some of these problems. And, and one of the examples he gave is like, what you really do is you find out empirically does something work. And it's only that it works with respect to some data set. So you don't have a little formal proof um, that it works in general. So it works on Tuesdays, and you test it on Thursdays. I'm borrowing his example. And great, it seems terrific. And then you test it on Thanksgiving, and it's different. And like, um, you, you don't have a prior way to know that except to actually test it on Thanksgiving. Um, and it, so it's also very difficult to verify that these systems work. And so the consequence is a huge amount of technical debt. So D. Scully is at Google, turns out to be um, the nephew of John Scully, who, who ran Apple for a little while. Um, has, has this um, paper called Machine Learning, the High Interest Credit Card of Technical Debt. And the point is, you can fairly quickly, especially if you're good at linear algebra, come up with a solution that works reasonably well for any given problem, um, often by making a lot of dodgy assumptions. 
um, dodgy assumptions about distributions of data sets and what they're going to be like um, as problems scale up and so forth. And so you make a, a proof of concept, but you don't know what part of your system is actually responsible for why things work. You don't know what's going to happen if you change it. So DeepMind built their Atari game system, um, and it played Breakout really well. Vicarious has some cool demos. Uh, I'll show you a similar one from, from my own uh, company. Uh, Vicarious has some cool demos where they change the intensity of the pixels, and suddenly the DeepMind Atari game system can't play Breakout anymore, right? So there's no formal proof that the system is going to work if you vary the problem from the test set that it was trained on, or the training set that it was trained on, to a new set. Like, you want your system to be guaranteed to work even if you change the lighting intensity. You know, the human brain up to um, some limits is pretty good at recognizing the same situations. If I flipped out the lights, I'd still understand that you guys are all here and still be able to have the same kinds of interactions with you and so forth. That's not true of the DeepMind system. Um, so there's this great cartoon that XKCD uh, ran uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, so one guy says to the other, this is your machine learning system. Yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra and you collect the answers on the other side. And the other guy says, well, what happens if your answers are wrong? And he says, well, you just stir the pile until they start looking right. That is what happens empirically in the deep learning world right now. Um, people do things like, I'll add another ResNet layer, or I'll add another ComNet, or I'll change the stride length. And some people are really good at that stirring, like Ilya Sitzkever, who runs OpenAI, I think is you know, a genius at figuring out how to stir the linear algebra for a particular problem set. But this is not a methodology, I think, that is getting us to strong AI. It doesn't give us robust, verifiable solutions that we can use in the context of building larger systems. OK, so the second issue um, is that statistics is not the same thing as knowledge. So there are lots of cases where knowing a statistical regularity gives you knowledge, but there's lots of knowledge where you don't really have the statistics and you still can reason about things pretty well. A lot of that um, is what I would call common sense. I don't want to say all of it or most of it, but in a certain subset. So I have a review with Ernie Davis on common sense reasoning in, common, uh, in AI um, that ran in the, the communications of the ACM about two years ago. Um, what did you describe it? Oren, Oren recently reread re the paper and he said it was something like um, totally brilliant and completely depressing or something, <laughs> something to that effect. Um, or fantastic and depressing. Um, so um, the cover of the issue, we didn't do the art, Ernie Davis and I, but um, we inspired, I guess, the art. I'm not sure that's a, a compliment, but we inspired the art. So it is a robot sitting on a tree limb, and the, the robot is about to take a chainsaw and cut that tree limb, um, which, of course, as they say in Ghostbusters, would be bad. Um, you don't want to learn this fact about tree limbs and which side of the tree limb you, you uh, should be on by having 10,000 trials, right? You don't want to fall and, you know, have a distribution of people underneath you, um, some of whom died, right? It's not, not a good way to do it. It's not even a good way to think about the problem. This is not the kind of knowledge that you should acquire by trial and error or by reinforcement learning, by having robots move the chainsaw a little bit each time and seeing which version um, causes the least harm to the pedestrians underneath and so forth. This is the wrong paradigm. So I want to give you and, and to um, stoke Oren for the conversation we're going to have um, some, just like a basic example or two of common sense. So here's one. Um, can a spider get out of this jar? So if it's a sealed jar of a particular shape, and I tell you, you know, I'll even just assert it. I'll say, you know, the spider in here can't get out of the jar, right? And now I want to know how general is your understanding of that? And so I show you other jars, and if you're a human being, you can make some pretty good guesses that the spider's probably not going to get out of these jars either. I mean, I could be playing you know, games, and we can talk about what games. Um, I could be playing in terms of there could be a little secret hole in the back or whatever. But you, you can make the inference that under ordinary circumstances, the spider's not going to get out of any of those jars. Um, but the spider, uh, it would be easier if the lights are out, but you can probably tell it's a broken jar. And so you know if it's a broken jar, the spider can probably get out. You may have never done that science fair experiment. I mean, some of you may have played with ants when you were a kid, and so you've got a little relevant data. A lot of you have no real direct experience on broken jars and spiders climbing out, but you can make the inference perfectly well. This is completely lacking, I would say, in most of what we've got in AI right now. Um, another example, broken jar, you can tell that the spider is going to get out and the jar can be of any shape. Um, here's, here's another example kind of in the same vein. So I discovered the other day, um, preparing a version of this talk, this thing, I've forgotten the name of it already, but it's something like a yarn feeder or something like that. So I looked at one yarn feeder and then I did a Google search for, the, for more and 
you know, they can look really pretty different. So it's not an association, you know, a direct association from all the sensory features. This is not the one that I ordered, mind you. Um, but, um, you know, once you get the concept, you can say, oh, here's a whole bunch of them. And you can figure out, like, what it's for and, and recognize arbitrarily large uh, numbers of them. So that's what I think about common sense reason, what common sense reasoning is. The field isn't even trying to do this. So um, Oren, I know, is not a fan of Doug Lennett's psych. But Oren knows what Doug Lennett's psych is. We've had conversations about this. Um, show of hands here. How many people here know uh, what Doug Lennett's psych is? Even here, it's not that many people. I think this is a, a problem in the, the educational system of the field. So Doug Lennett's psych system, for those who don't know it, um, was a concerted effort to make a computable version of common sense knowledge. It was started in the 1980s. It continues today. It's probably something like 1,200 person years of, of effort. Um, I would agree with Oren, I think, that it was not successful. It has not been turned into any major um, commercial product. It still seems incomplete in terms of the knowledge, despite all of that effort. Um, but it was, I think, the most concerted effort to say, can we encode common sense knowledge in a form that machines could compute over it? Um, and even in this room, which is probably more sympathetic to that kind of thing than you know, the average room in AI, most of you haven't heard it. When I w spoke about, or when I asked the same question at NIPS when I was on a panel with an audience of 800, I got about the same number of raised hands as here, the same absolute number um, is raised here, which is to say not that many people even know what the problem is. And my view is that Lenin was trying to solve the right problem, which is if you want to be able to do things like read open-ended text, or look at images in open-ended ways, you need to know how the world works, and you need to have that represented somewhere. And yet, as far as I can tell, nobody in AI is even really, except, you know. So, I think we agree <laughs> the problem is great, but you said there, there weren't a lot of commercial applications. The, the real problem is that there weren't a lot of research results that came out of it, either with their own work or other people using their, their results. So, I mean, there's a reason why the research community hasn't heard of it, Yeah, no, there's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of problems with it. So, I mean, another problem is they did what they did in isolation. It wasn't a project that involved the community. It was, e even from what I understand within the con confines of psych, it was mostly kind of a very top-down driven project um, in which maybe other people who didn't, you know, think it should be done the same way didn't maybe have that much voice. Um, so th there are lots of reasons why I think it failed. I was, I was giving the lack of commercial results as one index of, the lack of publication is, is I think, both symptom and cause. Um, so I mean, I, I didn't mean to say those are the only issues with it. I was just giving examples. Um, nonetheless, I think what Lennon was trying to do is important. All right, so here's, here's another issue, and I think they're actually related. Um, the standard bias in the field is to assume that virtually everything in, in the, um, that you need to know is learned, that you need to start essentially with a blank slate. I think there's a huge bias. This is what the debate with Jan LeCun was about in part. Um, so LeCun will look at the world and he'll see that something's broken, right? There are, there are people like Andrew Eng, there's got to be like a, um, a, a joke in this somewhere. Um, I, I work on this afterwards. But so, so you show a Andrew Eng a, a broken light bulb and he says it, it works. I think this is how the joke goes. Um, you show Jan LeCun a broken light bulb and what he says is you just need to learn how the light bulb should work. Um, and what I say is it would help if you knew something in advance about what a light bulb is supposed to do. So most of the field doesn't do it that way. Most of the field says, I'm going to learn it all from data. You showed everyone else a broken light bulb, and he says, just give me 40 years and, and, and I'll fix it. And I'll make it. Right. We're going to do the Oren version afterwards. <laughs> um, so, so I think if you look at the cognitive development literature, which is really where I was trained, the language acquisition literature, there are tons of reasons to think that in biology there's lots of stuff that's innate. So Pinker's book, The Language Instinct, which I hope everybody here will read eventually, um, if you haven't already read it, lays out some arguments for why we might think that language is innate. How are we doing on time? I don't know if I'll go through them. But um, the, the, the number one argument is really the poverty of the stimulus argument. Um, this is really Chomsky's argument, but Pinker explains it very well in the, in the book, The Language Instinct. And the argument there is essentially there's an infinite number of sentences we can understand and generate and so forth, but we get relatively limited data. And if you think about what I was saying about deep learning, it's actually a form of the same argument. So deep learning interpolates very well between known examples and extrapolates 
abysmally once it gets out of the space of examples that it's seen before. And I laid that argument out, um, I think, particularly crisply in my book, The Algebraic Mind, uh, in 2001. I think that fundamentally still is the case. Um, and more generally, you could back away from the details of, of deep learning. Most learning algorithms, if they start with no constraint and they're faced with you know, potential infinities, are going to have trouble. There's something um, by, uh, I get my Walperts confused, D David Walpert, called the no free lunch theorem. Um, which basically says all algorithms have bias, and starting with a bias that like any particular version of language is equally plausible is probably wrong. Um, then there's like the robustness um, with which kids learn language across lots of different environments. You can talk to them directly or not. So some cultures think that the way that you know we talk to our kids in like in Manhattan and give them lots of feedback or whatever is silly. It's like talking to a plant. And they, they don't talk to their kids as directly, but the kids learn language in those cultures too. So there's a robustness to the system that you don't see again in a deep learning system. So like a lot of the work in deep learning right now is on something called like curriculum design, or I forget the um, exact term, but it's like, well, we're going to figure out how to sequence the training data to the system so the system gets um, the result that we want. And human kids don't require that. I mean, there's a little bit of it that you know we optionally do, but they can learn from, you know, they get to the same place from very different input signals. Um, and there's lots of uh, Experimental work, yes. It seems like they, uh, they do require that. I mean, you can't just talk in uh, using adult language to a two-year-old child. Like, well, there, there, there's actually anthropological data that says that you can. We don't do it in, you know, the, at least, you know, I don't do it necessarily in my family, but um, I come closer to, to talking to my kids like adults than a lot of people do. Um, and my father certainly talked to me like I was an adult from when, when I was little, and you can make whatever extrapolations you want from that. Uh, but there, there, there is anthropological data looking at societies where they just don't talk to kids. Like I said, they, they think that's like talking to a plant. They think, why are you doing that? And yet the kids manage to learn. I mean, they partly learn by talking and interacting with their siblings and so forth, but the, the regimes are very different, and there's, there's a substantial um, literature on cross-cultural variation that makes me comfortable in, in saying this. Um, that there can be pretty substantial differences in, in how, in what the nature of input. So, like, Mother Ease is allegedly cross culturally universal, but the data on that are not um, so strong. And, you know, there's lots of kids that don't get that much of it, but they get there. Um, so, um, there's also data, there's been studies for years, I'm just giving you the most recent, that show that you know, younger and younger kids are able to understand different things about the world. This is one that just came out in Current Biology a couple of months ago, and it shows that kids distinguish between the top picture A and the bottom picture C um, in the womb. And uh, B and D are showing how that might look inside the womb because they're using lights from the outside and the light diffuses. But the point is that, that pre-newborns are able to distinguish between faces and inverted faces. That looks a lot like innateness to me, yeah. So, brother, quick question. How does um, what you just said correspond to the fact, like, as kids reach about 18 months, they sort of lose the ability to understand different tones and generate different sentences? So that's, I mean, that really hold that in your head for a second. Let me get to a summary slide in about three slides that I think pertains to it. Um, uh, looking at the biological evidence, there's an astonishing amount of brain organization, even independently of even internally generated experience. So there's a great and um, insufficiently cited study um, in science where they built a knockout mouse that basically couldn't learn anything because they turned off synaptic transmission. And then they looked um, at birth, and the knockout mouse is essentially in its brain structures, as they could measure 15 years ago. Um, indistinguishable from a mouse that could do some internal learning. So there's a lot. I'm not saying everything is um, permanently wired at birth that relates to my um, answer to you. Um, what I'm saying is there is a lot of pre-wiring of the brain, which is what I think innate structure amounts to. Um, most of your genome is expressed in your brain. A lot of it's expressed in very um, specific ways, and a lot of the best data come down the street from the Allen Brain Institute. There's, they're going to have a new paper, I think, in a couple of weeks that I think makes this overwhelmingly clear. Um, and there are a lot of mechanisms in evolution in terms of things like duplicating genes and stuff like that. I wrote a lot about this in my book, The Birth of the Mind. Um, and there's more and more evidence that part of what evolution has done is to refine the, the initial structure of the brain. Um, so the, this goes back to your question. The way I see it and wrote about it in The Birth of the Mind is pre-wiring doesn't include rewiring. A lot of times when people have the nature-nurture thing, they're like nature versus nurture. 
but it's really like nature allows nurture. Rewiring the brain is just a particular set of biological and genetically driven mechanisms that allow you to adapt things in certain kinds of circumstances, just like um, we have mechanisms for recovering from scrapes on our knees. The, the, these are innate mechanisms that, that allow uh, change in response to the environment. But there's a lot of stuff, I don't know if I need to go through it, whole slide, um, showing that John Locke was wrong. We, we aren't born as blank slates. Now that's biology. It could be different for AI. Um, but I think in biology it's just overwhelming. But then you go back to someone like Jan LeCun, and they don't even put on the table the possibility that you could have innate structure in your AI system. So LeCun and I agree about like common sense is really hard. Kids are much better at it than machines. And then he says, well, what does that mean? That means there must be some learning paradigm that we haven't figured out. Well, that's possible, certainly possible. It's probably even partly true. Um, but the other possibility is that there's innate structure, too, that we're missing. And people don't, I guess my slides are slightly out of order. The, but the usual presumption is what we need to do is to fix the learning paradigm. The, in the space of design choices, innate machinery generally gets ignored altogether. In fact, when Dave Chalmers and, and uh, Ned Block and Jan LeCun and I were negotiating what the debate was going to be about, there was some discussion about maybe we should talk about AI and nativism. And uh, Chalmers' first idea was maybe we shouldn't debate about that because he did a Google search for nativism and AI and got a did you, did you mean me uh, error message. Mm -hmm. Like so few people even think about this question. There's nothing that's been written about in the last 15 years. Um, I think this is because of a bias. Um, I would call that bias physics envy, that um, people like LeCun want the answer to AI, or sometimes the answer to neuro neuroscience, to be something like four equations you can put on a t-shirt, because that's what works in physics. But I don't see any reason to think that that has to be the case for AI. So possibilities for, next, for reaching next uh, level AI, one is we need better learning algorithms. That's what LeCun thinks. I think that's part of the answer. But we probably also need more machinery constraining what those algorithms learn. So that's kind of possibility C. And I think it's very rarely studied in the context of ML. I think common sense reasoning has to start by having at least a little bit of element B and not just tweaks in, in the linear algebra for element A. Um, Everybody knows AlphaGo and probably AlphaGo Zero and the astonishing learning that, that um, you know, DeepMind has managed to do in Go. This is the less astonishing learning they've tr done when they try to learn language. So they have a artificial world. You can wa walk around it and it has to do things like find the green comb or whatever. Um, and you know, it's the same group of authors like Demis Hassabis who are, who are on um, the Go stuff, and they've got a model that's a convolutional network combined with an LSTM, all the kind of stuff you'd expect these guys to do. And over time, it learns a bunch of stuff. We don't need to go into the details, but eventually, you know, it learns a training set, and oh, wow, isn't that great? Um, but if you look at the axis down here, it's like it's taking you a million training trials to learn a couple of words. If you know the developmental psychology literature, that is pitiful. Um, kids can actually learn meanings of new words, or at least something about the meanings of new words, in like one or two trials. So it's grossly inefficient compared to what is theoretically possible. And they didn't even put in the paper, but somebody from the, the lab gave uh, a talk in NYU recently, so I discovered what happens if you try something like stay away from the fridge. So now you have negation. Instead of just learning correlations between features, you have to learn correlations at a, at a more abstract level would be one way to think about it. Um, the data were so bad they didn't put it in the paper. So the, the system simply could not learn. Um, I took a picture on my cell phone to get it because it wasn't in the paper. Um, that's why it's all distorted and funny looking. Um, uh, the system isn't anywhere near that. So you have problems like Go where you have all this data, you can simulate things in perfect fidelity, and you get reasonable performance. And then you have problems like language um, where it's not just correlations of features and, and it's just not as good. Um, nobody ever believes me about nativism. They, they don't want to think that human beings have innate structure. But for some reason, they don't mind when I show this video, which I'll show you, um, which is uh, a baby ibex climbing down a mountain. So the baby ibex cannot do reinforcement learning. And you can do reinforcement learning to fine tune a little bit. But you know the cost of error is death. right? And so over evolutionary time, the baby ibex's brain has been tuned to know something about how to climb mountains. And it does it pretty amazingly well. But it doesn't make a lot of mistakes. It's not an RL system. Um, in fairness, I don't have the music here playing. It's too bad. Um, but this is what happens when we take our current AI and robots. All the things, you, you may have seen this blooper reel last year from the DARPA competition. Um, uh, sorry. Um, 
all of the tasks that are here are actually tasks that were tested in simulation. But the real world is not identical to simulation. So they use the robot operating system to do simulation. They train on tasks like opening doorknobs, and then you put them in the real world. They don't work so well. All right. Um, I think for the first time in my career, I find myself in agreement with Jeff Hinton. Um, we both think we need to start over. He, had, he gave this very interesting interview to Axios um, a couple weeks ago, about a month ago, um, in a conference in Toronto. And he actually said maybe we need to give up on backpropagation, which is the thing for which he is famous and the local minimum, I think, that the field is stuck on. Um, what he thinks we need to do next is unsupervised learning. That'll be the last part of, of what I talk about before returning to questions. Um, so both Hinton and Lacoon, who are you know, two of the biggest figures in, in machine learning and hence right now in AI because that's the popular part right now, um, they both point to unsupervised learning. Well, what is unsupervised learning? There's, there is two kinds that I think are in the literature and then there's the kind I think we should actually think about. So the one kind is um, what people call cluster analysis. So the Google cat detector is the most famous version of this. The, the Google cat detector watched a lot of YouTube videos and they did single cell psychophysics like a neuroscientist would do on the model and they found a neuron that looked like it was recognizing cats and it was on the front page of the New York Times. This was in 2012. That model is no longer in production. They couldn't get it to do anything useful, um, but it, it got a lot of press. This is a kind of unsupervised learning. You see a bunch of these pictures, not labeled at all, and you try to figure out is there some like natural classes here of, of these things that I've seen. Um, I don't mean to speak ill of it. I think this is a necessary technique probably in the, the grand scheme of AI. Um, then there's another version that Lacoon is talking about. Um, we don't have to read all that text, but um, which is basically like I watch a bunch of frames of a video and I try to build, build um, to predict the next frame. So it's a very clever idea. Instead of having a teacher like paying a bunch of people on Amazon Turk two dollars an hour in order to figure out how the world works, um, you just take videos, and videos have temporal continuity, right? So what happens in frames one, two, and three typically predict what happens in frame four. It's not 100% of the time, but generally they're pretty predictive. So you know, here, here's a pretty easy case, right? Somebody is, is pedaling and you can guess where, where their feet should be next. And so um, Lacoon is trying to pursue that approach to unsupervised learning. He's trying to predict what happens in a video. Often it doesn't work that well, partly because um, there are many options. So if you're looking at highway traffic, you can predict frames, um, but you don't want to predict the average of the frames that you see. Um, you really want to predict distributions in some um, fairly abstract way. So you don't want to take the average of the people who go straight, the people who go left, and the people who go right. You, know, you, go, you could take the exit ramp, you can move over a lane, you can keep going forward. If I just take the average of that, I just get a blur. And so a big challenge in this field has been to how to not get a blur, how to represent the kind of range of logical possibilities without um, blending in between. Um, that's a problem those guys have to solve. I can talk about it, but that's not what I think we should think about when we think about unsupervised learning. Um, part of the reason is, um, in the words of, of um, my friend Eric Simoncelli, who I think is the only computational neuroscientist to have won an Emmy Award, um, he said, you can't model the probability distribution function for the whole world because the whole world is too complicated. This is what I think Lacoon is, is mistakenly getting himself into, is trying to predict the entire world, and there's just too much there. Okay. Um, I think what's going to happen, before I get to my own, I, I sort of said this out of order, what's going to happen is the same thing that I think has happened to deep re reinforcement learning. Um, so in, in deep reinforcement learning, you have the illusion that you've gotten somewhere when you don't really, um, because you, you bound the world. As soon as you move the world a little bit, it's different. I mentioned the breakout thing before. Here's something my old company, Geometric Intelligence, did. We train um, DQN um, from, from DeepMind on this particular game over there, 3D game where you have to um, basically like fly your plane through, through um, through towers, and given enough data, the algorithm can learn. It can learn any um, fixed set of, of situations. But now, we move the, the, um, the obstacles around, and it just flies right into them. Because it hasn't really abstracted the notion of you know, safe space, or, or clutters, or collision, or anything like that. It's just memorized contingencies between pixels. I think what's going to happen with the unsupervised learning literature, if people insist on doing it straight from pixels, is exactly what's happened to DQN. DQN doesn't really work. You know, DeepMind got a lot of press out of it because it played a lot of Atari games, but they never tested could it transfer its knowledge even to different levels on a video game. 
Okay, so um, this is my daughter Chloe, and um, we were in Vancouver in the summer and sitting at a Whole Foods. This is a reenactment, I should say. I didn't get the first time through, but um, she sat in this chair and she looked at this aperture and she thought, I wonder if I can get, it, get through this. This is unsupervised learning. It's like, nobody's telling me to do this. I'm not going to try it 10 million times because that's boring, but I'm going to try it and see if I can do it using the knowledge that I have about the world. So she was able to replicate for me. What happened the first time is she kind of looked at it and she figured out a way through, and then she got a little bit stuck, and she did some problem solving to figure out how to get her arm through, and eventually um, she succeeded. That's unsupervised learning, right? It's not 50,000 trials of reinforcement learning and getting injured, you know, which her father would not allow her to do, and, and so forth. Um, it's, I see a problem, I understand the limits of, of some system, and I want to push that system harder. Um, unsupervised learning, as it's currently practiced, is nothing like what Chloe is doing. Um, so there's like unsupervised learning as a trade name for a particular set of techniques. I don't think that's getting us anywhere. The broader thing of how do you get systems to explore spaces they haven't explored before, I think is very interesting. Um, how am I doing on time? I, I have a little sh thing about innateness, but and I don't know how much time you want me to allow because I know there's like a discussion after. Um, I'll do this in a minute or two. Lots of models already have um, innateness, but it's not very principled. So um, here's AlphaGo, not AlphaGo Zero, but the original AlphaGo paper from a year ago. Um, and to some extent, you look at it and you say, well, that's just a neural network, and Demis will tell you, you know, we don't have any handcrafted rules, and, and people get all excited about it. And then you look in the back of the paper, and there are all these things that are actually innate in the system, like um, how many uh, spaces a, a system can go, I mean, a, a player can go at a particular point. Well, they, they definitely do better this year. Um, I should say, there was also Monte Carlo tree search built in, um, which is something that's been critical in Computer Go for 15 years. So there are lots of ways in which, even if you don't believe in innate knowledge, you still build it in if you're a neural network kind of person. So you make choices about how many layers do I want, what types of layers, what should the input units stand for, what should the activity function be, et cetera, et cetera. So then they just released this paper, which has made me more angry than any paper that I've read in the last 15 years, um, in which they say mastering the Go game of Go, and then the part that makes me angry is without human knowledge. Um, and this is just a false claim. You can see it again in the abstract, but I won't take you through it. So they say, what we have done here, and the media has believed it like completely, is we have a new algorithm that can learn anything, and you don't need to teach it anything about the domain that you're using. Nobody seems to have noticed that of these 17 authors, 10 of them were authors on the last paper which built the last world champion Go, and one of them, um, if I can find where he is hiding here, um, is in fact a Go champion. So they had a lot of human expertise here, despite the title. And somehow nobody in the review process called on, the, on that. But it turns out they actually build in lots of stuff that's very relevant for Go. So it starts with Monte Carlo tree searches built in. It would have been truly amazing if they had a reinforcement learning algorithm of some general nature and it had induced Monte Carlo tree search in just the form um, that they use it. But that's not what actually happened. They started with Monte Carlo tree search, which anybody who has ever worked on computer Go in the last 15 years would tell you is a fundamental component. They actually wired that in. Then they did other things, like they noticed that the Go board um, is uh, invariant across reflection, rotation, and so forth, as a, a good mathematician would tell you. And so they built in data augmentation to deal with that problem, and they built in uh, specific special customized sampling in their Monte Carlo uh, tree search thing in order to deal with that. And they built in transformational invariance in the form of convolution in just the places that they need it. So you look at the architecture, you know, they have it in 19 places and not the other 20 places. They built in parameters like what the stride length or the convolution would be that are suited to um, a Go board of that size but might not be suited to a Go board of another size. And then it gave zero evidence, literally zero evidence, that the system could actually be used unaltered uh, on any other problem. So the heart of the claim is we don't need any human knowledge. We have a universal solvent, but they didn't give any data for that. Now, how that got through peer review, I don't know. Um, what I think we need to do is actually to think about innateness, but in a more principled way. So here's one way to think about it. Um, this is from Liz Spelke, one of the world's great developmental psychologists now at Harvard. Uh, I think she's at Cornell when she wrote this. Um, she said, if children are endowed innately with abilities to perceive objects, persons, sets, and places, then they can use their perceptual experience to learn about the properties in, uh, of such entities. It's far from clear how children could learn anything about the entities in the domain. However, they could not signal out those entities in their surroundings. So she's 
both making a positive claim about what some innate knowledge might be for, for humans um, and animals, um, not for AI, which wasn't on her mind, um, but she's making a positive proposal about some of the stuff that might need to be innate, and also making what um, people in the language field would call a learnability argument, saying if you don't start with at least that, then you're in trouble. I made related kinds of arguments in different domains in the book The Algebraic Mind. I was talking more about computational prerequisites. You could think of like, is the brain a little bit micro, like a microprocessor? What are the basic instructions you need? So you need, for example, to have operations over variables. So in the debate I had with Lacoon, I made a list of 10 proposals. I said, these are things you have to have innate in your system if you have any hope of getting something like human level cognition out of your system. Um, only one of them is typically embedded in neural networks today, which is translational invariance, which is actually the technique that Lacoon himself invented of convolution. Um, the others mostly are not, and mostly willfully, I would say, are not. Like People don't want to explore the space of the rest of them. Um, in a crucial point in the debate, uh, David Helmers asked Lacoon, how many of those 10 would you build in? And Lacoon actually said zero. And I said, well, not even translational invariance? I mean, that's what you're famous for as convolution. He said, nah, if we have enough data, we don't need it. So I mean, there was a real debate there in, in the end of the day, which is, do we need stuff like this? And I would say, when we've tried to get away without it, we really haven't gotten very far. Um, this is uh, a diagram from a paper that Ernie Davis and I have. Um, he made the diagram. I didn't have that much to do with it, except maybe to tell him to do it. Um, I'm a, but I'm a co-author on the paper. Um, this was looking at just one little problem, which is understanding relationships about containers. And in order to get this to work right, he built in knowledge about things like time, space, objects, history of where things have been, actions, and so forth. I don't expect anybody to you know, particularly accept these particular details, and I'm not going to run through them right now because I want to wrap up. Um, but I don't think it's an accident that what Ernie needed in order to get the containers to work right is essentially the same stuff that Spelke and I um, independently have been talking about for a while. I think we need to think about things at this level. What is the knowledge you need to represent time and space and objects? And, I mean, this goes back even further, right, to, to Kant and critique of pure reason. Kant made, um, I think, the first modern nativist argument, and that's the things that he pointed to. I think we need to start thinking about how you get those into our system along with the power of machine learning to uh, learn from data. But don't learn these things, too. If you don't start with those things, then you're at pixels and you just don't get far enough. Um, I wrote this in The New Yorker uh, five years ago, um, and some people would think I was totally wrong, but I think if you read carefully, you realize it was not. So I said then, deep learning suddenly got popular, and I said, okay, that's great, you know, but realistically, deep learning is only part of the um, larger challenge of building intelligent machines. And I argued in particular, I didn't say that deep learning would make no progress, but I said that such techniques lack ways of representing causal relationships, are likely to face challenges and acquiring abstract ideas, they have no obvious ways of performing logical inferences, and they're still a long way from integrating abstract knowledge. I would say five years later, there's been no progress on the things that I singled out as, as being ineffective. So to finish up and then I'll take questions, and I think we have an after session for at least some people, um, machine learning is great. I don't mean to tell people to stop doing it, but deep reinforcement learning, which is you know, the popular stuff that's in the news all the time, purely from pixels, is just not actually getting us closer to artificial general intelligence. Anybody who thinks that is true is not looking at all of these tests of transfer and things like that. We also need knowledge in our systems, knowledge about things like space and time and objects and so forth, um, and strong starting points like, uh, well, I guess I just kind of said the same thing, but rich initial representations of time, space, action, uh, objects, and so, et cetera. Then maybe we can begin. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think another way of phrasing the same ideas that you have is that for any given problem, um, there's an amount of data that you need to learn a problem. And in theory, with machine learning, if you had an infinite amount of data, I mean literally an infinite amount of data, and you had infinite processing capacity, you could learn all these tasks. Um, I think the real problem is that the, we don't have a good way of estimating the complexity of real world tasks. And from that, we can't say, yeah, well, if we do machine learning, we're going to need 30 million videos of uh, somebody trying to put a spider in a, uh, in a jar. Um, and then you can say, well, you know, that isn't really a solvable, uh, that isn't really a solvable problem. Whereas, as you point out, with recommended render engines, we could say, to achieve our 97% level, we need a million cases, and we've got this. 
So in some sense, it's a amount of, it, it's the way um, the learnability of a problem, how much data is really required, I think is really the issue. Yeah, I mean, another way to put that is we have proofs that, um, you know, neural networks of different sorts are universal approximators or Turing equivalent. There's a, a range of the, uh, these kinds of proofs. Um, and they never actually face the learning uh, Problem. So th those proofs show in the limit, if you have infinite data, you can do x. But they don't say if your data are sampled from the distribution, but they're not perfectly representative of everything that you're going to see, how well are you going to do? And so it's not just the, the sheer numbers. It's also you know, the relation, how similar are these cases to the other cases. But everything does rest on that. And so yes, if I could see everything, I mean, then I could just have a big lookup table. Um, the question is, in the real world where you get limited data, let's say for language, how are you going to deal with the cases that are, that are outside? And you know, one, one solution is you avoid ever having data outside your space because you collect so much of it. And then some domains, many domains, you can't really do that. And then maybe you need a different architecture. Other questions or comments? If you're going to, uh, <coughs> if you're going to argue that you can learn, learn the stuff that you say uh, uh, innately, for uh, general intelligence, then the, the amount of data that you need is not comparable to the data in one person's experience, but it's comparable to the data in the evolution of the human species. That's time, right. right. There's a, a weird um, kind of like modus operandi in the field right now, which is everything gets set up as a training set kind of problem. And so like I thought about this in connection with your reading challenges, for example. Like, to the majority of the people in the field, that's a question of like, is the training set the right training set for a reading or something like that? But really, like if you understood science at an eighth grade level, it's not about I read these 12 sentences or 400 or 500,000 sentences um, in a particular text. Um, so people are trying to solve things. Everything is kind of like a database and generalization problem. But that's just not how we do things. You know, there's certain domains where we do it that way. So, you know, catching a fly ball is like that. But there are other domains where the training set is life and under, your understanding of physics and your understanding of psychology, it doesn't come neatly packaged in something you can download from Kaggle. And you know, the whole field is like in this like Kaggle mindset that I think misleads people about what the real problem is. And then they get to your challenges and they don't do that well on it because it doesn't really fit. I mean, I can have the last five years. Um, science questions, and you can game the fact that answer B is more likely than answer A or something like that, and you get that out of training set, but it's not really teaching you biology or, or, or geology or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, catching a fly ball is not, right, but protecting your head from being bashed with a fly ball is probably pretty innate, right? Like, like uh, there's calibration there. I mean, a lot of systems have calibration. So you know, you you learn your, your eyes, for example, grow and the distance between them changes, and what you need to do with the muscle forces vary. So you probably do have an innate, um, you know, shield yourself reaction, and then that gets calibrated um, to some extent by experience. Again, on this point I just made, like it might not be experience of people, you know, beating the crap out of you with with baseball bats. It it might be that you have general systems for calibrating your motor forces. And you have a system that is about protecting your face that can actually pick up on parameters that are set elsewhere. And another way to put it is there's no portability of knowledge in the current system. So they learn something for that task. They don't learn like generalized constants that you could use across 40 different motor tasks, one of which is protecting your head, and another which is, you know, you've got another option there. What's your opinion on this new work that's like sort of on adversarial deep learning and then? We train all these stop signs, and we add a sticker, and then the model always says this stop sign is a 60 mile per hour speed limit. Yeah. Speed limit and things like that. Like, where does that fall into this? You know, I think that GANs, which you're referring to, are cool, and and also this general notion of like trying to figure out what the cases are where things fail. Um, I sometimes think about this in the driverless car domain. So like one of so the problem with driverless cars is it's easy to make them decent and very hard to make them really good. So you don't anticipate if you don't anticipate that a car can take a left turn or a truck can take a left turn across a highway, then somebody dies. That's what happened in the in the Tesla situation. So one thing you can do is like a lot of simulation techniques in order to try to guess what the adversarial cases are. Um, 
you could maybe take other techniques or you could maybe move out of this paradigm at all. So the, what people are placing their bets on is we will just construct the right data set and then we will learn it using you know, the right mix of linear algebra. But there's a, at least logically another possibility which is like when people drive they actually have an understanding of the world around them and that allows them to make inferences. So I could see a guy on a pogo stick. I've never seen that before when I'm driving but I know something about pogo sticks and I know something about um, driving and I put together this knowledge. Um, GANs are not really dealing with the latter version, but they could deal with like what if it's a little bit outside the, you know, the space of, of cases I've seen before. So I think it's good work. I'm not sure it's getting at the, the heart of the problem. And like with the stop signs and the speed limits, like you can keep training those things, but it, it feels like you know a better way to put band aids on, on the fundamental problem that like you don't have concepts there of even that there are different classes of behaviors that you're trying to mediate in the driver. And so you're putting band-aids around the fact that these particular squiggles can, can fool the system. So uh, I think we should stop. Let's thank Gary again. Thank you.